attaining Jesus' faith. And the word of the Lord is already blessed. We have to discover the God DNA that's in us already. We have to be able to walk in the God DNA that's in us already. And we're going to have to attain the Jesus faith. Jesus moved in the will of the one who determines outcomes. We have the same opportunities to move in the will of the one that determines our outcomes. God not only will determine the outcomes in our lives, but in the lives of those that we love. And you may not think like I think, but I'm going to tell you what I personally believe. I believe that those people praying for me when I was living outside the will of God is the thing that brought me and kept me. That God applied his mercy in double doses and he applied his grace to one who didn't even appreciate it because somebody trusted and believed God on my behalf. Jesus understood that if I look to the will of God, I'm looking to the one that can change every outcome. It doesn't matter what the natural order of things are. And this is what we get hung up on things, the natural order of things. But I serve a God that created the natural order and can change the natural order of anything and everything according to his will. God is trying to get us to understand that we have an opportunity we have an opportunity now. We're trying to wait to be more saved. We're trying to wait to be more righteous. We're trying to wait to memorize more scripture. We're trying to wait to learn to pray more perfectly. Thank you for being so attentive and waiting for me. I'm sorry, I got, when we had that prayer, my mind just went into another place. Thank you for waiting for me to release you. Thank you. But we have to understand that while we're waiting for something else to come, God says, I have got something in you already. There is something in you already that you don't even understand. We have dumbed down the miraculous gifts that God has placed in us because we have walked in them so long. God said, be fruitful and multiply. And I don't care how great science gets. Science needs what comes from a man and what comes from a woman in order to create life. God gave us the ability to create life because you have the God DNA inside of you. You have the ability. You have the ability to have an imagination to create something in your mind and actually go out and build it with your hand because you have the God DNA inside of you. The most unintelligible person in the world today has a mind that's greater than the greatest computer because God gave us a mind that can never be understood because the depth of the mind goes deeper than any man can ever begin to understand. We got to attain the Jesus faith. In the simple story of feeding the 5,000, God showed me that this was an interact, interactive demonstration, an interactive demonstration of faith that led to a miracle. And that Jesus wanted to use everybody in. See, a lot of miracles are just a one-on-one -on -one thing. And there are a lot of things that take place in the Bible where Jesus has told them that your faith has made you whole. But, but Jesus wanted to show those that walked with him how their faith could lead to a miracle. I want us to see today how your, our faith can lead to the miraculous, that we don't have to answer just for whatever natural looks like. We don't have to ask, we just don't have to settle for whatever the natural says it's gonna be. We don't have to settle for where we came from being the determining factor in where we're going. We don't have to let what we did determine on what we're going to do next. Oh, my God, my God.
these people came to Jesus, John said they followed him because of the miracles that he had done. And this is important. Jesus looked at him and says that they, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep not having a shepherd. I'm, I'm using Mark and six this morning. And after he began to teach them many things, and this is why you have to look at the gospels because this story is in all four gospels. And if you take time to look at all four gospels, you'll see a little something different that each writer brought out because John attributed it to their, them being a part of his miracles and they followed him. But in six and 35, he says, when the day was far spent, his disciples came and says, this is a deserted place now and it's getting late. The hour is already late. So you probably need to send them home or send them somewhere to the surrounding country and villages so that they can find them something to eat because they didn't bring anything to eat. And Jesus answered them and says, you give them something to eat. You give them something to eat. But Lord, I'm just tarrying and waiting on you. You are the one that needs to go. Well, I need to call them and see what they're going to do. No, you are the one that's going to do it for somebody else. Well, maybe if they are able to loan me, no, you will be the lender and not the borrower. You, you trust in God and you be the head and not the tail. You be the one that determines that I will, in my heart, follow his commands, and I believe in my heart that blessings will chase me. Blessings will chase me because I follow his command. I follow his word. Oh, I stumble and fall, but he gets me up every time I fall because he sees my effort and he sees the effort of my heart. We got to get this thing now to where we Understand that God looks at our effort. God looks at, at what we are trying to accomplish. God looks at the motives behind everything that we do. He looks at the motives behind everything that we do, not some things that we do. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. And they say, it. well, we don't know where we're going to get it. If we had 200 denarii, if we had 200 days of wages. Listen to what I'm saying. If we had 200 days of wages, we're still not sure. See, because now you're trying to feed a lot of people. And the, the surrounding villages and towns didn't have enough. Even if you had the money. See, God is trying to get you to discover the DNA, the God DNA inside of you that you don't have to think about what somebody else don't have. You always know that God always has. Oh, my Lord, my Lord. Don't sit around and say it if you don't believe it, that God will supply. My God, my God will supply. It doesn't say a few needs. It says my God will supply all needs. The Bible says that God says that, the word of God says that my God will supply how many? Say it again. Say it like you believe it. And it's done not according to nature. It's done according to his riches. When he resides in glory. Because he allows glory to come into our lives. Come on, somebody. No matter where we are. Oh, my God, my God. My God, my God. And he said, go see, go see what's out there. John is the only one that records the lad. Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't record the lad. But John records the lad, and I think that having the lad there is important. Having the lad there, re recording the lad there is extremely important because, because there has to be an accelerant sometimes. There has, to, there, has to be, there has to be something that kicks it off. There, there has to be somebody who, who, who starts this thing through their own heart because they didn't take it from him. He gave it to him. Come on, somebody. See, there, there was a boy who, who had been taught the right way because since somebody had sent him out, equipped. 
All of this 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, were not equipped for where they were. But, but there was one boy that somebody sent out well equipped. See, we got to learn to go out well equipped and we got to learn to send our children out well equipped. It don't matter if your children 50. Come on. You've got to equip them, glory to God, whether they want to be equipped or not. That's why that fervent, effectual prayer of the righteous will avail much. You send them out there equipped and they won't have a choice but to share because sharing will be a part of their heart. Amen. See, when they come out and they got no lack and they, they see somebody else in lack, their hearts will be filled with compassion also. I had to talk about the lad because the lad was the accelerant that, that kicked everything off. And it says that. Got five. Five loaves. Two fish. We're not talking about loaves that you would see in the grocery store. What he had could be carried in a little cloth pouch. It was something similar to name for pita bread. And it's not like we go out now to restaurants and see these huge pieces of name or pita bread or, or stuff that, 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 that covers up half a plate. Those people have come to this country and says, you know, Americans like to eat a lot, so we got to put a lot out there on the plate for them to make them come back. We're talking about something probably a third of that size, five times. And two fish. Two fish. And I have read and studied this years ago and says the fish were large sardine-like fish. Large sardine like fish. I have to break it down, not bringing out the terminology of this type of fish, that type of something that everybody can, can, can relate to. But then here it comes the command. This is the test that Jesus says that will build up your faith in the future. Command them all to sit down in groups of green grass in groups of hundreds and in fifties. Jesus did not make the command. They were there to see Jesus. They were there to hear Jesus. They were there for Jesus' miracles. But Jesus says, now, if you are mine and if you're going to follow me, come on, go do what I tell you to do. Well, they won't listen to me. Go do what I tell you to do. How many times is it that God is trying to tell you to do something and you're saying that I'm not equipped for this? You're equipped for it if he said you're equipped for it. God will never send you anywhere to do anything that you have not already been equipped for. God will never send you into a place that he's not already been. Come on, somebody. We got to come back and understand now that omniscient means that God knows not just right now, but he knows the outcome. Jesus was not dealing in omniscience. Jesus was dealing in, in obedience. Lord have mercy. We, we want to have omniscience. We strive to have omniscience. We want to know what the outcome is going to be. And God says that the reason that you're caught up in the place that you're in, the reason that you're stagnant right now, the reason that nothing is moving in your life, because you will not give over to obedience. Sit down. You got 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. And I've read that some have counted the numbers from 10,000 to 15,000. But you have these thousands and thousands on the hills. And you have this small group of men. And let me tell you what blesses me. <laughs> I actually heard this a long time ago, that you got to be willing to feed somebody else when you're hungry. Ooh, baby. <laughs> come on, come on. Let me tell you how to discover your God DNA. You start being more interested in feeding somebody else when you're hungry yourself. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> See, the church has forgotten that when we pray for somebody else, God begins to answer our prayers. 
We have forgotten that when we take the focus off of ourselves and me and mine and look at them and theirs and begin to sow into them and theirs, God begins to sow into our lives. Amen. Oh, my God, my God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then listen, listen, after they had sat down, he took the five loaves and the two, the two fishes. And I know this may not mean much to y'all, but in 41, it says, 6 and 41, it says, he looked up to heaven. Body language means everything. When Jews prayed, listen to what I'm saying. When Jews prayed and made supplication, all Jews, priests, regular lay people, Pharisees, they bowed their head. Jesus' body language changed everything. He looked up to heaven. And when I saw that this morning, I was reminded that David says that I have to lift up my eyes to the hill. I have to lift my eyes up to the hill. From which cometh my help, and my help cometh from the Lord. I can't find anything that when I bow my head, I'm coming in humility. When I bow my head, I'm showing God my worship for him. When I bow my head, that's a time to bow my head. But when I want to talk to God, I got to lift up my eyes, glory to God, and I got to have the confidence that he'll hear me. I got to have the confidence that he'll answer me. I got to have the confidence because God is looking at your body language. Oh, my God, my God. Some of y'all better hear what I'm saying in here. Listen, some of y'all are missing it. God looks at our body language. Do you think that humans only look at body language? Let me tell you something. Why is it in the human realm that people say that they will deal with people who show confidence? Because they're looking at your body language. If you show that you're confident, somebody else will have confidence. Faith is contagious. Somebody open your mouth and say, faith is contagious. It's dependent on your body language. And Jesus looked. He lifted it up. And he blessed and broke. Blessed and broke. In order to discover the power of the God DNA inside of you, there has to be a period of blessing and brokenness. We don't ever want to receive the brokenness, but the brokenness has to take place to receive the blessing. Come on. We want to stockpile blessing upon blessing, but there are some things that have to be broken in order for the blessing to have room to come in. You have to understand that Jesus was tapping into a capacity that was unseen. But Jesus believed that there was capacity. That's why he broke it. Sometimes you're thinking that the devil is working against me and I got people working against me. But God is trying to show you that you have capacity that has not been tapped. And you will not even come to realize that capacity until the breaking takes place. Amen. We love to hear the word blessed, but we don't understand that being broken by the hand of God is, 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 is imperative to our growth. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Mm. I'll preach to myself if I, because I'm getting excited. Lord, have mercy. But let me show you what God did. After he did that, he gave. He gave. You got to trust in what you have said. You got to trust in your actions enough to pass it out and not worry that it's going to be enough. If you want to get to Jesus' faith, you can't worry about if somebody's going to say, this, this ain't enough. You've got to stand on what you believe in. You've got to believe in the facts of faith and not the facts of the natural order. And we are so caught up on the facts of the natural order that we don't understand that the facts of faith are invisible. Oh, Lord Jesus. Jesus. Let me tell you something. This is something that we need to come back and realize. The Bible teaches that we are saved by grace through what? By what? Now, how is it that you've got enough faith to attach it to grace unless there was something great already inside of you? I ain't going to talk about none of y'all. I'm going to look at that picture in the back back there so nobody think I'm talking about him. 
but I'm talking about some rotten folks who did some rotten things. I'm talking about some lying folks, glory to God, who opened up their mouth and didn't even pay no attention to lying. I'm talking about some folks that was nasty with their attitude and with their actions. I'm talking about some folks who did whatever they wanted to do that it even surprised the devil sometimes. But God placed in you, in your DNA, enough faith that when grace popped, you had enough faith to say, here I am, Lord, take me. Here I am, take me. Here I am, take me. See, if I would have started this message out talking about attaining the Jesus faith and would have talked about how you can turn water into wine and how you can, how you can get uh, increase and how you get it, this is what excites church folk. But Jesus made this to be inclusive. I'm going to show you how to be included in my faith so you can walk in my faith till your faith gets stronger and I show you that this faith will lead to the miracle. It will lead to the, the unseen will become seen. Come on, somebody. Oh, my God, my God. See, I know some of y'all saying probably knew what it blew my mind the other day because I was looking and I was searching and I was like, Lord, it's getting late in the week now and I'm studying a lot of things. Tell me what I'm going to preach Sunday, please. And I'm looking, I'm looking and I'm praying and I keep studying different things, different scriptures, different outlines, and nothing was coming. And the Lord showed me, have you not paid attention to my faith? And I was like, wow. He said, everything that I did on this earth was by faith. Y'all look at me being all God, and I'm trying to get you to see that I was in the flesh. So I'm showing you, I came not just to save you from your sins and deliver you from the hand of the devil and break the spell that hell had over you. I'm coming to show you that what you can accomplish in your faith, that God will move through your flesh because you got the God DNA inside of you also. Oh, somebody put your hands together. My God, my God. I was, I was totally astounded because I had missed that Jesus was trying to show his guys and through his word, he is trying to show all humanity what is, I mean, what, what we are able to do in the flesh because we have been beaten down so often that says, well, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Well, that's when my flesh is acting on its own. But when my flesh acts under the spirit, glory to God, there is no telling what my flesh can accomplish because my flesh is not operating under my mind. My flesh is operating under the strength of the spirit of God who is God, amen? We miss it. Jesus has been pointing to humanity and saying, you can do great things, but your flesh has to be connected to these things. These things. The miraculous cannot be more important than the word. The blessing cannot be more important than your obedience. Mm -hmm. And we have to be committed to God in a personal way without explanation or apologies to others. You can't be committed to God if you got to explain yourself and you got to apologize for being different. You're going to waste your time apologizing for being different. And then talk about how much faith you got. You got to feel like that you got to explain what God is doing to you to some people who don't have explain, believe in God. No way. He says, this is the faith. This is the God DNA that Jesus is trying to show us to walk in and we can appreciate and we can have for our own. Amen. No explanation. No explanation. And after you commit to God in a personal way without explanation or apologies, he says, you have to learn to trust God without any personal reasoning and no earthly understanding. God is not going to operate in my understanding. And I don't know what I would call it if I'm serving a God that I can read his mind and I can know his way. And I can determine what he thinks. Come on. 
What do you call that? That's not serving a God. That's serving an idol. Lord, have mercy. Somebody help me in here. Somebody help me in here. God says now, in order for your flesh to do this thing and for your God DNA to come through, he says, you have to have a willingness to live beyond your natural understanding and your natural being. And you got to be willing to go when you don't know. I hope y'all right. Because I heard one person say, amen. You got to be able to go when you don't know. We're waiting to know where we're going before we go. It was Abraham's faith that was accounted to him. Abraham had an account in heaven with his lying self, with his sleeping with his, 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 his wife's uh, 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 servant self. He had an account in heaven. It's an accounting term. He had built up capital in heaven. He had, he had built up spiritual capital. We missed this. He had built up spiritual capital in heaven so that he could not be spiritually bankrupt because every time something happened, God continued to invest in him. Oh, Lord, have mercy. We, we are church that's always wondering why we can't have and why we ain't got because we are spiritually bankrupt because everything is based on the natural and the natural only. Oh, my God. My God, my God. Ah. And the next one that the Lord showed me, we have to go to where there is no point of reference. You have to be willing to go where there is no point of reference. You got to, Abraham, you got to get out of your comfortable place. You got to get out of your comfortable place. You got to go where there's no point of reference. You got to go to where you don't understand the people. How is it that we don't understand why we're not growing? Because you don't go nowhere to grow. You watch the same programs when you hang with the same people. You have the same conversations all the time. You don't want to step outside of anything that, that's, that's not what makes you feel comfortable. Listen, let me tell you something. I'm 65 years old and I see the ignorance that's inside of me. And I challenge my ignorance to try to find something and learn something that I don't know. That I don't know. That I don't know. It's prideful just to sit back on what you do know. Let me tell you something. You know how to boil an egg? Well, okay, that's all you're going to have in your life if you don't let nobody teach you how to do nothing but boil an egg. Um, how appeasing is that going to be to your palate after a while because you don't want nobody to tell you nothing? Oh, my God, my God. I'm breaking it down the way you can understand it. Does anybody understand and say, I get it? God is saying, we have to make sure that we go to a place to there is no reference point. There is no reference point. There is nothing here. Listen, listen. Faith is never lazy. And faith is not here to appease the flesh, but to use the flesh. Jesus says, I'm going to show you how to be relatable to God in a way that you didn't even understand was possible. You don't know how to partner with your father because you're scared of your daddy. You're scared of your daddy. When you come to a place of maturity, all of us, all of us, when we come to a place of maturity, our parents allow us to come into another type of relationship that we had that, that we didn't have when we were younger. And why is it now that, that we don't want to mature in that place with God because we always want to keep on being little children? We want to keep on being little children. Oh, my goodness, my goodness. You know the dangers that it does for a child when they keep on receiving milk, either from the, mother, the mother's breast or from some type of formula? It affects their teeth, it affects their gums, it affects their growth. And after a while, that thing that brought about nourishment actually began to make them sick. God is trying to get us to grow up. Tell somebody, grow up. He's trying to get us to grow up so that we can see the possibilities and what's available to us in God. 
and in this partnership because God is saying, as my children mature, then I can trust them with more responsibility. And the more I trust them with responsibilities, I have to add things so that they can carry out the responsibilities that I'm trusting them with. Lord, have mercy. Did you get that? Glory to God. Glory to God. We're thinking that I'm, I'm just wanting to have this just so I can have it and so that I can, I can know that, that I got it. I can go to church and show everybody I got it. Jesus says this in Matthew 21. Matthew 21 and 18. Now in the morning as he returned to the city, he was hungry. He was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. He spoke a word. He spoke a word. Listen to what I'm, listen, listen to, look at the scripture. He spoke a word. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled saying, how did the fig tree wither away so soon? Now look at what Jesus says. He says, assuredly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, that's the big one. Do not doubt. Grow up and believe what you believe. Grow up, believe what you believe. You will not only do what was done to the fig tree, you will not only do what I've done, but you will also say to this mountain, be removed and cast it into the sea, and it will be done. It will be done. You will say this. You will say this. He, Jesus is saying, don't marvel at what I do. I am showing you what's in you already. Stop just reading the miracle and be a part of the miracle. Attain the Jesus faith. Jesus is saying, he didn't say, well, I'll, when you get to heaven. He says, listen, you're asking me, how did I do that? He says, if you stop doubting and speak that thing, speak it, speak it, put it in the atmosphere, put it in the atmosphere. Let it seem crazy to somebody else. Confound even your own thinking. And then God will act on your behalf because your faith is not in yourself. Your trust is not in the natural elements. Your trust is not in what the tree can do. He, your faith and your trust is in what God can do and when God can do it. Amen? Oh, my God, my God. He said, and don't stop right there. You're talking about this little tree. In Luke, he says, you can speak to the mulberry bush. The mulberry bush has a root system so complex and so spread out, you can't really hardly kill it. You can't really dig it up, and it lives for up to 600 years. He says, if you speak to something that is down, deep, complex, speak to it. It'll obey you. He said, it'll obey you. He said, speak to the mountain. The mountain will obey you. Stop waiting for things to be proportionate to what you think and what you see in your eye. He said faith is so powerful that the mountain, if you tell the mountain, God will crumble the mountain before you. The Bible says he makes the crooked places straight, glory to God. He doesn't have to wait for a construction company. You speak it and you will do it and he believe it. Because he said, if you believe whatever things you ask in prayer, believing, somebody say believing, you will receive. That's the word of Jesus. Believing. Believing. I'm, believe, I'm not just believing in what I said. I'm believing that I'm going to receive it. See, that's the doubt. We'll say something, but we don't believe it's going to happen. We'll say something and get timid right away. Oh, Lord, I shouldn't say it. You have to speak it and believe it's going to take place. You got to stop that nonsense of trying to put a clock on God. Well, let me see. I'm in trouble here, so I'm going to need that finance to help. And I'm going to need the, the doctors because they say that I'm in this stage of this. And well, Lord, and I'm going back to the doctor next week. And God says, until you get your doubt right, you'll keep on going to that doctor. And you'll keep on going to that doctor. 
and you keep on going to that doctor and you don't even realize that he's blessing you because you're still alive going to the doctor. He hadn't healed you yet, but you're still going to the doctor. He hadn't let this thing kill you yet, but you're still going to the doctor. Until you believe this when that's when the breakthrough comes. When you start believing, then one day you realize that, oh, I have not gone into the grave yet. I have not gone until I see you yet. I have not gone. It had, I'm still going through this same cycle. And the cycle continues, glory to God, until I believe. Somebody say, believe. Mark 9. I'm trying to get us to the place of seeing what Jesus was training his disciples for. We are the disciples of Christ. We are the sons of God. We have been adopted. And the Bible teaches us that we are now the temple of God. Somebody say, I'm the temple of God. The Bible says that we are a holy priesthood, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. We are this. We are, it was not we're becoming this. We are this. But you still think of yourself as some sinner on the sideline trying to make it on in. Come on. You ain't gonna never have nothing sitting on the sideline calling yourself a sinner just trying to make it on in. You magnify your faults. You magnify your bad decisions. You never give God glory and you stop looking at what God has before you because you keep on peeping back over your shoulder what you did do instead of what God is gonna do. Amen? My God, my God, it's time to grow up. Tell your neighbor again, grow up. In Mark and nine, and I, I used Mark because this is in Matthew also, this story, and it's in Luke, and they explain that, and it's different how they see it. The boy has epilepsy. But here they say it's a demonic oppression. And I said, well, Lord, how can that be that one gospel says it's a sickness and another says it's a demonic oppression? He says, because you need to grow up. <laughs> because everything that man calls sick ain't because of your body. We have accepted everything that a doctor or, or somebody has written in a book as a sickness to say that this is the natural order of what I'm supposed to have because I caught it. We have accepted that we are supposed to be able to have these things that we catch and these things that afflict us just came because that's the natural order of life. Yeah, there are natural things out there that do afflict us, but there are some things that, that are demonically a part of oppressing us with this thing, amen? And if we open ourselves to the demonic, if we open ourselves to anything other than God, yes, we will be sick with it. That was the explanation that I got. If you, if you want to read other gospels and they say something different because they are one and the same. Because man was never intended to be sick. Man was never intended to die. Come on, let's go back to what God created in the beginning. When he said, be fruitful and multiply. When he gave man the ability to build and tear down. When he gave man the ability to take care and to take over everything that has ever been made. He gave man the ability to do this. And man was not supposed to die. Man was not supposed to be sick. Go back and read the Old Testament. When he told Israel, you won't get sick if you follow my command. I don't care what nobody tells you. I don't care what you've seen in the movies. He said, when he opened up the Red Sea and they walked across, it was on dry land, according to the, if you got to, if you got to find uh, arts and entertainment or some of these scientific people to explain the Bible to you, you ain't got no faith. You ain't got no faith. The Bible says simply, they crossed on dry land. They crossed on dry land. Well, how can it be dry? Because in the beginning, God called up every drop of water that was in the sea. When he said before, he said, he said, he called up every drop of water that was in the earth and decided where it would go. And he put it where he decided it should go. Then God said, amen. Whatever God says, that's what it will be. And we got to get back to that because we are losing our God DNA. Taking anything that the world said we stole to have. And believe in it. Believe in it instead of believing our God. My God. My God, my God. 
So this boy, Jesus asked when they brought him to Jesus. He said, how long has this been happening to him? And the father said, from his childhood. And the father went on to talk about what had happened. And Jesus says to this man, he says, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Those of you who don't think that you're saved enough yet. Those of you who don't think that you got enough scripture under your belt yet. Jesus just met this man. This man had not said under his teaching, this man had not been around all the miracles that he had done. This is a total stranger. Jesus says, listen, he says, if you can believe all things are possible to him who believes. A total stranger. Why do the people of God who say they trust in the word of God have a problem believing that when Jesus could walk up to us, have a total stranger come up here and say, listen, if you believe, if you can believe, oh my God. He says, these things are possible. See, when Jesus said the word possible, I began to look up that word, and possible is a move. Possible moves you from a place to a place. Possible is a move. When Jesus says all things become possible, Jesus is saying, now I will do a shift in your life. You will move. Your life will move. There are some things that are move in your life. Amen? Oh, my God, my God. Possible means to become powerful. Possible means to become. Listen, if you don't believe me, look it up in the Greek. Look up the original text and look up the original meaning. It says possible when Jesus is using it here. When Jesus is using it here, it says that possible means to become capable, to become able. Possible means that that means that now I am mighty. Now I am strong and I, I have power through Christ. Amen. Power. Jesus was saying you have power not only over demons, but you got power over sickness. If you believe, you got power over sickness and demons. If you believe, if you believe, if you believe, all oh, if you believe, but now let's grab hold of uh, that word believe. That word believe is to entrust yourself and commit to that trust. You got to be committed to trust when you ain't in church. You got to be committed to trust when you get off the phone with somebody that's saved. You got to be committed to trust when everything seems like it's turning against you. You got to be committed to trust when everything goes dark in your life. You got to be committed to trust when depression is sitting here telling you how you need to just come on in and cover up and don't go back out there no more. You got to be committed to trust when there is no money, when there is no, no outlook, when there didn't seem to be any light. You got to be committed to trust when your back is against the wall. You got to be committed to trust when you are getting hit on every side. Somebody better hear me in here because our commitments to trust are when things feel good. Our commitments to trust are when we're around certain people. You got to be committed to trust when things look bad and know that he is still God and that he will do whatever he said that he will do. It doesn't matter what my situation looks like. It doesn't matter the circumstances I'm dealing with right now. He is God and he will do what he said he will do. There is nothing in this world that can change the heart and mind of God. When God decides to bless you, when God decides to heal you, when God decides to bring you up, when God decides to bring you out, there is no devil in hell that can stop the hand of God when the hand of God is working in your life. But you got to commit yourself to trust. Somebody say amen. amen. And there was one meaning with trust that caught my eye in its original language. It says that to trust is to credit. To trust, let me, let me break it down in a language you can understand. To trust is to say God's good for it. <laughs> What's say, elder? Uh, you got to be bold enough to say God is good for it. God is good for it. You take your credit card and you go buy furniture and then people say somebody's good for it. You take your credit card and you go buy this, that, and the third. And then people say, the bank is good for it. Visa's good for it. MasterCard is good for it. Somebody's good for it. They don't see your money. 
but they know somebody is going to pay your debt. Come on, somebody. We've got to get to a place that say that God is good for it. God is good for it. I ain't got it, but God is good for it. I ain't feeling it, but God is good for it. Amen. Can somebody holler, God is good for it? My God, my God, my God. My God, my God. Yes, yes, yes. Oh. Mm. Jesus is talking this to a stranger. How much more will he do for us who are supposed to believe? And sometimes what we've done is we've allowed ourselves to become religiousized inside the house of God. We've allowed ourselves to come and, 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 and pattern after somebody else. That's why I said early on, we have to be committed to God personally. Personally, I can teach you all day long, but you have to be committed to God personally because when that sickness comes, when that depression comes, whatever it is comes, it's coming to your family, it's coming to your house, it's coming to your body, it's coming in your life. It ain't coming up on me because that's coming up on me. I got to handle it. I got to put it to God's credit. I got to say, God's got this. God's got this. God is good for this. God is going to take care of this. God can. I, I, listen, it don't matter if it makes you cry. What makes you think that you got to be smiling and in a good mood to say, God has got this. God has got this. God has got this. I ain't worried about this. I put it to God's credit. I accredit God for fixing it. I might have tears running down my face, but God has got me and God has got this. Amen. Amen. We need to have that kind of faith. When we're trying to build something instead of, and, and when we're trying to do something instead of waiting until the bottom comes out. We don't bring God into this when we're building, only when we're trying to rebuild. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. See, we think this thing, <laughs> y'all quit making me laugh. But we have to learn to understand that so much of what Jesus is trying to show them is what he's been trying to show us. And we've been reading over it and we haven't taken it to heart because we don't think that it can possibly happen to us. We don't think it can possibly happen to us. And somebody in this room and somebody who will see, uh, hear it later, We'll say that's a that's that sounds good. It'll just run all over their head. That's out. That sounds good. You got to make it personal. See, because this God DNA has given everybody gifts. You know, we 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 like to hear about gifts and God's gifts and their 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 gifts and their talents and. Oh, they're talented to play a sport and they're talented to draw pictures and to play music and to write music and to, and to sculpt. And oh, they're talented to do this and to do that. Let me tell you something. That is only a small part of the gifting God placed inside you when you got your DNA. You got to remember that you are made in the image and likeness of the almighty God. I don't care what mom and daddy look like. Mom and daddy may have forsaken what God had placed in them. Don't you carry it on. It doesn't matter what somebody else decided that they couldn't do. You start trusting God for what you can do because you have God gifted gifts inside of you. And you got to realize that God gives it to everybody. We look at these people in the Bible and we, we put them up on some kind of pedestal. But Moses didn't have nothing. Moses had a stick and a stutter. Moses had a stick and a stutter and, and, and a criminal record. <laughs> he, murdered, he murdered a soldier. He had a stick and a stutter and a criminal record. He was on the run for 40 years. Statue of limitations run out and when the Pharaoh died. <laughs> so 
But God used an inanimate object. God used his brother's voice till he got confidence in his own voice. God will use things around you until you have that confidence. To, let me tell you how contagious faith is. I can be around your faith until my faith comes to fruition. I can be around your faith and grow merely by being around your faith. This is how it works. This is how it works. I need to be around somebody else's stuff until I can get my own stuff together. Come on, somebody. I learned by how I model something after somebody else, and then I take it to the one that gifted them, and then he'll show me my gifts. He'll show me my talents. He'll show me what he has placed inside of me. But I'll never know it until I see it. Ah. Not only Moses, Joseph. Joseph was 17 years old when they found him in that hole. God gave him gifts. But the gifts were not for him. The gifts were for a nation. The gifts were for a nation. And it didn't matter who treated him what kind of way. The gifts were for a nation. It didn't matter who had mistreated him. The gifts were for a nation. He had to keep moving in what God was doing. Listen to what I'm saying. He had to keep moving in what God was doing so that he could see the outcome that God had for him. Even when the fetters hurt his feet, he had to keep doing what God would have him to do. When he had told the, the baker and the butler what was going to happen, he said, don't forget about me. And they forgot about him. He said and cried, glory to God. But he kept on doing what he had to do. And he was willing when he got his opportunity, the Bible says that, that he shaved and he changed his clothes. He shaved and he changed his clothes. You don't think that's important, but sometimes God wants you to come outside of what you've been all them years you've been jacked up in prison. He wants you not to look like you've been looking. He wants you to present yourself as one. Because Pharaoh is going to look at your body language. Pharaoh is going to look at how you carry yourself. Pharaoh, listen, listen, listen. It's not just the knowledge that's inside of you. It's how you present yourself. Amen. James 5 and 17 and 18 says that Elijah was a man of the same nature that we are. But he prayed that there would not be rain and there was not rain. <laughs> and it goes back again it's, and he prayed again. And it rained. But it points out in James that he was of the same nature as us. There was nothing special about him. He was of the same human species as we are. You know, sometimes when we look at stuff like in Luke 8 and 49, I'm not going to go there for time reasons. But J. Iris, Jesus was walking with J. Iris after the woman with the issue had been cured and they sit and talk for quite some time. They came and says, don't bother the master because your daughter's dead. You can't listen to news and allow news to dictate relationship. You can't let the news that comes to you change who God is in your mind. You can't let what they call bad news or good news dictate what God is going to do next in your life. Because Jesus spoke something that nobody understood. Jesus says, no, she's not. No, she's not. Let me bring into something that you might be able to understand that some of these fracking in some places, they went to wells that they thought were dry. But they went deep. They went deeper and they found the oil that everybody had given up on. Jesus told the disciples, go deep and cast your nets. See, we're so quick to have some bad news or go through a bad experience. And all of a sudden we count God out because we gave God just that one chance to show up and he didn't show up like we thought he was going to show up. So now I'm going to take my little nets and I'm going to take my boat and I'm going on home now. 
And you got to get yourself back out there and say, okay, what do you say, God? What do you say, God? I'm tired, but what do you say, God? What do you say, God? I've done the best that I could do, but what do you say, God? See, there has to be a breaking point where God can come into our lives and get the glory because now I can't say I did it because I'm skilled at it. I can't do it. I can't say that I did it because I prayed all night long and I tarried. I can't do it because I said I knew this and I knew that. I had to be completely broken. Let's go back to that brokenness. The blessing comes when the brokenness comes out and you're willing to accept whatever brokenness that God brings into your life to bring an enormous blessing into your life because if God would compound blessings, you would become prideful and arrogant. You'll quit hearing God when God begins to compound blessings in your life. And we don't understand how we move with God step by step by step by step, rock by rock by rock by rock. He, we are growing from faith to faith, from faith to faith, from faith to faith. Had faith for a bus pass, had faith for a hoopty, had faith for a used car. Now I got faith for a new car. Come on, somebody. Had faith that I quit drinking. Had great faith that I quit smoking. Had faith for an apartment. Had faith for a part-time job. Now I got faith to open up my own business. Come on, somebody. Faith to faith to faith to faith. But along the way, there had to be some brokenness. There had to be some brokenness where I keep running back to God and saying, God, what do you say? God, what do you say? What do you say? Show me my God DNA. Show me what God has placed inside of me that you can do through me. And if you take time to read that Luke in 8, you get to verse 54. There's something important happening there. And, and some translations don't put it in there. And I wonder why some translations don't. It said he put, he put the people out. Last week I told about transitioning. You can't transition if you're sitting in the same chair. Sometimes you got to put some people out. Come on, sometimes you got to, you got to, look, you got to move, you got to put the negative out. You got to put the negative out away from you. Jesus led the blind man outside of Bethsaida. He says, no, Bethsaida is wicked. I'm gonna, and, and when he healed him, he said, don't go back in that place. When he healed him, he said, don't, do not go back into that place. Those people in Jesus' town, the Bible says that he could not do any great miracles there because they wanted to call themselves familiar. They want to call themselves familiar. Jesus says, I'm not fooling with doubt. I know what I can do, but I'm not fooling with doubt. We spend all of our time trying to convince somebody who don't believe. If they don't want to believe in the word, don't use the power of God to try to coax them in. We're trying to buy them into the kingdom. We're trying to dangle something out there. I forgot what it was. I preached a couple of weeks ago, but we're dangling something out there and saying, come on and get this. This is what God will do for you. It's not what God wants us to do. That's not what God wants to do. Faith doesn't perform. Faith creates its own narrative and its own platform. And that narrative is just for you. Don't try to explain faith to somebody else. Come back and tell them the story and share the testimony after it's over. Share the testimony after it's over, but faith creates its own narrative and its own platform. Faith has no room for fear. Faith has no room for unbelief. And I know somebody's going to say, just like the man uh, told Jesus, I believe, but help me in my unbelief. Jesus is good with that. Jesus is good with the honesty. Lord, I need you. I, I ain't going to sit here and try to act like I, I'm trusting every single thing to happen the way that you say it's going to. Help me. Help me in my unbelief. Help me, Lord. I don't want to doubt, but help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Grow me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Oh, my God, my God. Faith tells you right away. When nobody agrees with you, move. Somebody say move. We look at David killing Goliath, but we don't even realize it was faith to kill that thing. David spoke a word. David says, "Ah, oh, you uncircumcised Philistine. 
I'm coming at you in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he spoke to him. He says, this day, I am going to kill you and cut your head off by faith, by faith. He didn't wait. He said, I got to move now because after he said that the Bible says he ran at it. Come on, somebody. The Bible says after he spoke faith, he ran at the giant. He ran at the giant. What are you doing to your mountain? What are you doing to your mountain when you go to work on Monday and that mountain is there? When you look at your, your bank statement and that giant is looking at you. When you lay down and your body's hurting and you know it, that's that giant. That's that giant. That's that giant still threatening me. That's that giant still telling me what it's going to do to me. What do you do to your giant? You got God DNA. Run at it and say, God's good for this. God is good for this. God got this. I ain't worried about it. I put this to God's credit. I put this to God's credit and not my own because I believe in the most high God. Because God showed me in his possibilities, things start moving. It starts moving in the unseen. It starts moving in places, glory to God, that, that I don't even begin to understand. And as I get ready to close with you today, I want you to see something. That if you're willing to trust God beyond reason, beyond what's natural, and you're willing to walk it out, God will. That's just it. God will. We try to put so much behind that. God will. And one of the most miraculous things that the Holy Spirit showed me last night, and I said, Lord, help me to write this down so that this memory of mine don't forget it. <laughs> Jesus says to his disciples, listen, pay attention. Everything that he told them that they could do in their God DNA, they hadn't been given the Holy Ghost yet. They had not received the infilling of the Holy Ghost yet. He said, just the fact that you're made in the image and likeness of God will allow you to do this. Now, how much more can we do when the Holy Spirit dwells in these temples of ours? Somebody needs to get ready to use that God DNA to move a mountain, to uproot some trouble. Because God keeps reminding me over and over, faith without works is dead. They talking about it, but they ain't doing nothing. Faith without works is dead. They talking about it, but they hoping somebody else jump in and do it. Faith without works is dead. They praying about it. Everything that Jesus accomplished and told his disciples to accomplish, there was a corresponding action. God responds to our actions and to our voices. And I'm not talking about when we locked in with nobody around in prayer. I'm talking about when we boldly tell somebody I'm going to be all right. God is going to heal this. And if God don't heal it right now, he's going to give me the strength to bear it. That there will be nothing taken away from me, but God is adding on to me. That I may not be able to do what I used to do, but he has multiplied the things that I'm still capable of. Amen. That I have gifts that I didn't even realize before because I was dealing with the physical. And now he has shown me how the spiritual will overcome the supernatural and turn the natural into something that is natural. Amen. So as I get ready to close today, I want you to take time today and tomorrow. Add it to your little quick. Five second prayer. God, show me what my now faith is going to lead me to. 
See, because you get stuck in your now and you can't do nothing else. You prayed for it now. And if it don't happen by sundown, you don't gave up on it. You got to trust God for what your now faith is going to do for you later. Now faith keeps turning. Now faith keeps changing. Now faith keeps growing. We will attain the Jesus faith and begin to walk in the God DNA. Before I step down, I said something about it earlier. I want to pray that somebody has enough faith to believe God for salvation. I don't care where you are. I don't care if you see this on YouTube. I don't care where you are. Maybe you tuned in this morning online. Don't go about what you're looking at and how your life is and what you've done. And that's behind. You cannot change anything that happened one second ago. But God says, let me be in the next second. If you let me be in the next second, I'll take control over the next day. And that next day will become the next year. And you will be blessed for a lifetime in ways that you didn't deserve. But it's yours because you got the God DNA. Let us pray that somebody somewhere will receive Jesus today. I pray that somebody somewhere that's listening, somebody somewhere that says, Lord Jesus, please accept me as I am. Please, Lord, accept me as I am. Come into my heart right now. See, you can't sit with your mouth closed and think that this is going to happen. God wants to hear your voice because this is your faith if you speak it. If you just, he's not interested. He knows what you did but he wants you right now. Come right now. Please accept me. I believe that you will accept me as I am. And I believe that you will forgive me of my sins. Lord, I want to be yours. Thank you for looking beyond my faults and my flaws. Thank you, Lord God. I, I'm going to say thank you, Lord God, because I don't feel any different, but, but I believe that you said that whoever believes in their hearts and confesses their mouth, the Lord Jesus will be saved. So I'm trusting God today for salvation. I'm trusting God today for new life. I'm trusting God today for new opportunities and possibilities that shift you. Shift the way you think, shift the way you understand, and it even shifts your tolerance level because you've got God DNA. God DNA inside of you. We'll believe in God today for somebody in the house and somebody online and somebody that'll see it later on that they will receive. Let me pray a blessing over you today. The Lord bless you all and keep you. The Lord makes his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance unto you and give you peace a peace that surpasses all understanding that will guard according to the word of God. It will guard your heart and your mind. Somebody say in Jesus name. Say it again in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah.